Good morning. I greet you in the name of the triune God, the God of, that stands with those who are oppressed, the God who is a liberating God. We welcome you into this sacred space. My name is Justin. I am the pastor here at the United Church of Lincoln. And as we have stated in weeks past, no matter where you are, no matter where you're gathering, whether if it's a home just right down the street here or if it's maybe perhaps down in Kentucky, um, We welcome you into a shared sacred space because this is how we are learning. This is how we are adapting to be together. And it has changed the way that we think about our neighbors. It has changed the way we worship. And while it can be frustrating at times, it is also exciting to see what God is doing in this day at this time. So we welcome you. We welcome you into this space. A few announcements this morning just to put a few things on your radar, and I guess our big announcement this week deals with two matters of our annual meeting. Uh, Of course, our big annual church meeting would have taken place today, and we've had to adapt that because of the pandemic, but in the last few weeks, members were presented with several documents that were emailed or uh, sent out via mail, snail mail, and they were encouraged to reach out to us at the church with any questions and then vote on a proposed 2021 budget and slate of new officers. These votes were compiled uh, by submission from either an online form or a printed form or by other means of contacting the church office directly. Uh, That said, the proposed 2021 budget and slate of new officers both passed unanimously. So I thank you all for your cooperation in that. It was a really good turnout. We had a lot of responses. Um, Very impressed by that. So I appreciate your all willingness to to make do with what we've got right now. So thank you for that. We thank those who are coming on to our boards. Uh, Hopefully we'll be able to do something of significance to recognize them as well as those who are rolling off at this time. So thank you. 
Uh, newsletters, uh, hopefully, are, you have received those via email. They went out late last week or should be arriving in your mailbox early this coming week. If you haven't received one of those, please reach out to us and we'll get that to you. Um, and in the mentioning of the newsletter, I do just want to put a small B in your ear. Uh, so to be looking for future correspondence concerning our Ash Wednesday service, that'll be coming up in, my goodness, about three weeks. So uh, that'll be February 17th. We're looking to do something. Uh, obviously, it's going to be a little bit of an alternative, just like everything is anymore. Um, but be looking for information uh, through the mail and through email uh, regarding that. All right. And now... Let us take a moment or two to concentrate on our breathing. So wherever you are at, get, get in a comfortable position um, and just breathe with me in and out for a few moments. God of all, God who breaks down barriers, builds bridges, and shows up in unexpected places, be with us this morning, your people. As we look to you, we call out for you, we affirm your presence with us as we come here now to worship you with all our hearts and all our minds. Good morning. morning. Holy and awesome God, your son's authority is found in integrity and living truth, not the assertion of power over others. Open our imaginations this morning to new dimensions of your love and heal us of all that severs us from you and one another, that we may grow into the vision you unfold before us. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I have special music this morning. You know I don't get up here and sing. (laughs) But I have a a zippy kind of song that I found on, um, actually on 
TV one night, and I really like it. It's by the Hoppers, and it's shouting time in heaven. Before we get on the children's message, I have to uh, thank you, Kathy, for sharing that this morning. And for those that know the names I'm about to mention, it's probably a good thing Brother Glenn wasn't here this morning. He probably would have cut a rug over here in that. Or maybe even Miss Emma. Um, and that's, uh, you could probably find that song in Atlanta any day on any Sunday, uh, for sure. That's a great tune. Thank you, Kathy, for sharing that. Um, so at this time, uh, what we have begun trying to do again in our best attempts is to offer a children's message. And while 
I feel like the last few weeks, the children's message has obviously had some underlying that was an invitation for others to participate as well, and families, and um, I've even had a few uh, individuals reach out and say, you know, I, I kind of got a lot out of that children's message this past week. So um, while we invite our children to come and listen to this message, uh, we also remind ourselves to have our ears open and to see what God is speaking to us in that way. And so I, while I don't have a typical message this week, it's more of an announcement, but it's something I'm very excited to share with you all. And so I think maybe we can share the image uh, of what this is. And while that is loading up, I'll give a little bit of explanation around that. Um, there is no surprise, there's no doubt that I've had a, a very strong affinity for cooking and baking right now, and I've enjoyed it so much, and um, you kind of gravitate towards people who are doing similar work or passions that you have, and there is a young woman uh, who went to uh, Duke Divinity School down in Durham, North Carolina, and she put together a curriculum for children uh, around bread baking. And it ties in, it's kind of baking through the Bible, and there's a lot of great questions and good conversation. And some of the things that I've heard uh, our parents and those with families say, you know, this is a good conversation that we can have around the dinner table. It doesn't take a lot of, like, you know, extra prep work to do, but this could be something that, you know, uh, we could discuss you know, anytime during the week. And so uh, we have got that curriculum here, and what I'm hoping to see is that we, we take this, uh, this curriculum from uh, Kendall Vanderslice and we use that in some capacity here for those of us that have families. And maybe if you don't have children or your children are growing out of the house, this could be something that you entertain as well. Um, we're going to start later this month and there will be some details about that. But it, this curriculum shows us how to bake bread, how to make certain things. I think there's even like, what was it, some kind of crackers that you get to make on there. But this is something we can do throughout the week. And my hope is, is that those questions and that hands-on experience of, of putting our faith into our hands, into action, it will, it will spark something in us and speak to you. Um, and then... What I'd really like to see is that maybe sometime during the week after we all bake, maybe we could spend 30 minutes on a Zoom call and just say, how'd everything turn out? Did your bread rise or did it, did it fall? Or um, did, the, did the yeast, did it do what it was supposed to do? I would love to hear your experiences with this. And again, this can be open to anybody, uh, not just children and not just families, but anyone who wants to uh, attempt uh, bread baking uh, or, or making crackers or anything else. So... Check that out. If you've, some of, I've already sent it to some parents uh, and some families, but if you are interested in it, um, notify the church and we'll get that curriculum to you and so you can join us um, after, after Ash Wednesday, so the latter part of February. All right. Um, can we pray uh, before we uh, go back to what we were doing? Gracious God, you have given us a faith that is bigger than one hour a week. You have given us a faith, you have given us eyes to see everything that we do as an expression of how we sense you to be with us. Whether that is, you know, our friendships or that is, you know, finding ourselves in the kitchen or if it's our drawing or our writing, this creative spirit that we see in you, we know is instilled in us. Help us be vulnerable, <laughs> help us be creative in seeking out new ways to experience you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Patrice, will you come now and lead us through our prayers of the people? People of God, will you join me in prayer? O oh God of restoration and renewal, we come to you with our prayers for one another, and we admit that during this time, we are just tired. Our minds are spinning, our bodies are aching, and we aren't sure where you are sometimes in all of this. We ache for Sabbath and we rest for our bodies and for our souls. But how can we pause when work and life hang in the balance? It feels like we're pulled in all directions. Our communities, our commitments, our families, our futures, we're just trying to keep it together, it feels like, but we're tired from all the pushing and pulling. We ache for quiet in a shouting world. Help us remember, O oh God, that while productivity is lauded in our culture, you welcome us to pause in your kingdom. You, 
who call us beloved and beckon us to lie down, we ask for rest for every weary body and soul. Help us not push ourselves and others so hard that we forget the miracle of Christ right in front of us. And all God people said, Amen. Our scripture reading this day comes from the book of Mark. We are back in the book of Mark. Uh, we are still in the first chapter, verses 21 through 28. And this week, uh, it still comes from the New Revised Standard Version, the same version that we have uh, in our pews uh, here at the United Church. Starting in verse 21. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught, he being Jesus. They were astounded at his teachings, for he taught them as having uh, one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept asking one another, What is this, a, a, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, um, it was a few Sundays ago I mentioned to you all listening a gentleman I used to work with that had a very unforgettable name. Maybe some of you will recall it, a fellow by the name of Pookie. Uh, I described to you all, you know, Pookie's outlandish stories he used to tell and how even to this day his go-to catchphrase when sealing the deal on one of the whopper of his stories, one of his whopper tales was that my hand to God. And that phrase still pops into my mind when I hear a retelling of a situation from someone that seems a little too surreal to be real. Pookie was a character and one that is easily remembered. And as I said during that particular sermon, sometimes it doesn't take much to jog one's memory of a certain person, a place, or a time. Another such, uh, another such moment of the anecdotal variety creeped into my mind this week. It was triggered by my spouse Lauren, along with a particular muffin tin that we have in our kitchen. Maybe some of you all saw the post on my social media feed, the, the muffin tin in question, but for those who aren't scrolling through Facebook a few times a day, I'll just tell you that it is a tin in the shape of skulls. Now you can imagine Lauren picked this slightly macabre item up from the hellish outfit of William Sonoma during a post-Halloween sale a few years back, and she just had to have it. I was prompted to break it out again in order to make some special buttermilk and cinnamon muffins for a woman Lauren has bonded with during this pandemic time over their shared affinity for old local cemeteries. As you started, as and maybe you're at home, as you're starting to put this story together, I'll go ahead and do the favor of, yes, the pastor baked skull muffins. Yes, he dropped them off to a family in our community. Yes, he included one for their children as well. And yes, he understands how that might sound odd when you say it out loud. The family, however, got a kick out of them. And if we ever get out of this pandemic, there are plans to enjoy each other's company sometimes in the future. You know, making skull muffins took me back to Halloween and all things spooky. I have always enjoyed those things. Uh, and as I was baking those muffins that morning, I began to think of scary stories I had heard involving skulls and skeletons. Nothing gruesome, mind you, just kind of campy fireside type tales that give you a good shiver. While I enjoy reading these type of stories, I really like hearing people tell me about their own experiences, you know, those that spook them. I suppose my mind was swirling, and I began thinking of such stories that people had shared with me over the years, and, and I don't know, maybe it's because that guy Pookie had been on my mind recently, but I, I thought back to a time that I was working with him, working third shift, and some of the outlandish stories I heard not only from him, but from other co-workers dealing or coming in contact with the quote-unquote supernatural. 
It was then that I recalled a young man by the name of Marcus, who operated a forklift in the warehouse section of the building that we both worked in. Now, Marcus was a big guy, like Texas football size big. He grew up on the dividing line of Texas and Arkansas in that Texarkana area. Now, Marcus's size was impress impressive, and while he could be viewed as very intimidating, he really was just what we'd call a big old teddy bear. Always joking, always laughing, and he'd give you the shirt off his back if you asked him. So I remember this one time where we were talking about, you know, regional haunted places and local superstitions. And I mean, what else are we going to talk about in the middle of the night? You got to do something to make the night go by faster. So that's what we were, <laughs> that's what we got stuck on. And so Marcus, he was talking about that and he got to telling us about his grandmother and what she called the roots. Now, his grandmother was a regular church attendee lady, but she believed in some other things, too. And one of those was the practice of someone being able to put a hex or a cause bad fortune to fall on someone else. Now, his grandmother didn't call it voodoo or hoodoo. She didn't say that it was a spell or incantation. She called it someone has tried to put the roots on me or try to put the roots on us, meaning someone had set something foul against her or her family. And Marcus swore in his telling that one time she found a strange object in the backyard that she thought someone had purposefully placed there. And she took it out and burned it under a tree in the backyard to try to get rid of it. And she told Marcus that it burned an unnatural color. I thought of that story this week while in the kitchen in those early hours. I thought of how I had my own handful of stupid, uh, superstitiously driven experiences. I admit now, as crazy as it sounds, but do you all know that I truly felt that my actions played a role in the championship the University of North Carolina Tar Heels won in 2005. I really felt that my actions, that my going down and physically being on Franklin Street helped the men's basketball team win the championship that year. I believe, I believed <laughs> that my actions had a purpose and that purpose resulted in things unfolding in a certain way. While the term ritual might seem a tad archaic, that is exactly what my beliefs were rooted in, a ritual that produced a desire or particular outcome. Now, it sounds silly, doesn't it? But think of, the think of that. Think of those moments. The next time you come close to breaking a mirror, or you need to walk under a ladder, or you accidentally spill salt at the table. In those moments, do you find yourself thinking of the seven years of bad luck you just narrowly missed receiving? Or do you find an alternative route that sees you say safely out from under that ladder? And does that salt shaker you just tipped over, when no one else is looking, do you toss a little over your shoulder just to be sure? Just in case you risk having those roots attached to you or something else mysterious. While we might smile and even scoff at those who wear lucky charms and avoid, and avoid black cats crossing their paths, and while we feel sure of much in this world, there are just some things we can't explain that happen to us. We leave those instances as just being weird. There's a lot of weird stuff in the Bible. Serpents that talk, donkeys talking too, bread falling from the sky, and we, you know, we could keep going giving examples because Hebrew scripture is full of those miraculous moments. The Exodus story alone is chock full of them. And the gospel is no different. Jesus at times is described by the authors of the text to work outside the natural order of things, or maybe he's just working at a level most don't see. Part of our text deals with uh, one of those moments where the world of Jesus and the disciples encounter things that are, um, well, they're things you just don't see every day. Things that everyday folks nowadays just don't come in contact with. Our text opens with the author of Mark's gospel describing in a very Mark-like fashion the quick get up and go and launch of what can be described as Jesus' launch of his ministry. He's been affirmed by John the baptizer, and John has given him the seal of prophet approval. Mark has already shared with us Jesus' temptation by the evil one, the devil, out in the desert. He's begun gathering a group of followers, those who would walk with him on his journey. All the actions that need to happen have happened. Yet almost, you almost get the sense that Mark here knows that these events are steps, that they are leading to something else. 
that Jesus is building momentum and will soon share to the message the message of his purpose. The purpose that is tied up in God's kingdom. The kingdom that Christ himself has brought near. Here in Mark's gospel, the ball is rolling and it comes crashing into the synagogues where Jesus shares his message to all who gather. The synagogue was a natural place for this to happen. It was a place where those knowledgeable of the law and the words of the prophets, that they would come to speak and share and pass along their collective oral traditions to those listening. Synagogues were a place of teaching and learning. It was an institution very different from that of the temple where sacrifices and worship took place. The synagogue is where ideas were shared and affirmed and rebuttals offered. And it was what I would even call an open think tank. You know, unlike the temple where the priest acted as the intercessor of the people, the synagogue while all, you know, having some functioning officials, you know, the, they were there, the ruler of the building or the supervisor or the facilitator, it would be these people who would allow anyone deemed competent to speak and teach, get up and do so. For those who are familiar with the Christian community known as Quakers, or if you've been to a Quaker gathering, that atmosphere may sound familiar to you. It is in that same sort of, sort of space where Jesus shares his message. It is here that he relinquishes his teaching and his purpose. And when he does, it is written that the people listening to him are astonished. They are blown away, saying that he taught so differently from the lofty, believed, moral, superior, well-respected scribes. These scribes were, of course, expert in Torah, meaning they knew Jewish law and customs. And they also knew the commentary that went along with those. What I mean by that is, is when they taught, they would do this thing, maybe a phrase that you might know is they would name drop a lot, is, meaning that they would reference others. They might say something along the lines of, as you know, so-and-so's teaching suggests. They built arguments and stances off the beliefs of others like themselves, which is not a bad thing, mind you, but it's like when you ask someone their opinion and they quote someone else's opinion. It's problematic. If I ask you something and I want to know what you, it's like when I ask you something, I want to know what you think, not what someone else thinks. And this is where Jesus shines differently. Jesus did not rest in the authority of what others had previously taught. He spoke with his own authority, and this was refreshing to his followers, followers and listeners. In doing this, Jesus conveyed his message being worthy enough in its own right to stand on its own. And the people ate that up. <laughs> There's an old movie called Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. In the very beginning, one of the brothers is trying to get hitched. And he's trying out this woman's cooking. And um, she's made meatloaf. And she puts it on the plate. And he's like, you got any ketchup? And she goes, my meatloaf can stand on its own two feet. That's the way Jesus' teachings were. They could stand on their own. He does this here in the hub of the synagogue, the place of teaching and instruction. And so far, Jesus is doing what the space is intended for. Sure, he's got some new and refreshing teachings, but he's still working within the parameters of what people are used to seeing, a person teaching and instructing in that space. And then, well, something weird happens. A man with an unclean spirit shows up and speaks up. A man shows up who, in the words of my friend Marcus's grandmother, has had some roots put on him. All of a sudden, the scene changes, and what is to be expected now becomes extra mundane. The physical world and what might be described as the spiritual world, well, they collide with one another. Unclean spirits, demons, and devils, while being supernatural, were very much believed to be part of that time. It was very much to be part of the culture. They were very real things. It was common for people to believe to be under the influence of evil spirits. They were treated in several different ways. And while we'll see uh, what plays out here is almost like a form of exorcism, uh, there were other things that we can go back and look at archaeological studies and see that they did things to people in order to alleviate um, symptoms of what they thought was possession. Um, I think this is right. I should have asked Lauren uh, the correct pronunciation of this, but trepanning. Uh, which is this procedure. Uh, we have found skeleton remains where a small hole has been made in the skull of a person with the hope that the evil entity that possessed them, that that entity would leak out and seep out of that opening in, the, in their skull. 
There were, of course, different variations of these species of demons, each with a particular purpose that caused certain disorders and ailments. Demons that caused that cause blindness and other physical afflictions were commonly understood to be ever-present. They were around in the ancient world. Demons, too, specifically here in the Jewish tradition, were described as things that clung to a person. They were clinging to a person, treating them almost as a host while they manipulated them to do their bidding. The demon would control those who they attached themselves to, but the possessed person also retained or remained present in some regard too. And this is seen here in Jesus' encounter at the synagogue and later in other instances where demons, afraid of the Messiah and the believed demise marked by his coming, would surface in a person and beg for truth and mercy. In the text today, Jesus uses his authority, this time above and beyond that of just teaching and instructing. He uses it in a different way, a different sense, and he calls the spirit out of the man. His call releases the roots on this man's life placed by the demon, and the people witnessing this are impressed yet again. Jesus casting out the unclean spirit and the interpretation of this passage and other similar ones has left a heavy impact on the Christian faith. This is seen as early as the 4th century, when it is being documented that the budding church, the early church, already had a special exorcism order of priests, whose purpose it was to cast out unclean spirits. Of course, priests then and those today in Christian traditions that have a more formal procedure for performing exorcism, they follow a series of prayers and blessings. There's almost like a protocol. But Jesus here does it only with a word or two again establishing his distinct difference and authority. The ramifications of his words and actions, however, leave us today to ask the question, what do we do when we feel the roots have been put on us or on, or on those near us? What is to be our response? I got a few ideas, a few paths of possibilities. First, we can dismiss those things which we do not understand, such as those like unclean spirits, as an attempted explanation of symptoms that humanity had little, if any, knowledge of, let alone language to comprehend and describe at that time. We are, of course, talking about the ancient world here, and describing a demon possession surely made more sense to people who had a limited understanding of, say, the central nervous system and diseases that affected it and the brain like that we know of as Parkinson's today. One might say, well, those people living then just didn't know any better. And that's a possibility. Or we accept that in this case, as with other cases mentioned in Scripture and other holy texts, that demon possession during that time was very real, that it manifested routinely, and that it still does in some capacity today, and yet it goes undiagnosed. That, too, is a possibility. And then, well, I offer this. Whether you hold to unclean spirits or demons being active in the world, especially in the ways they are described in the text, or if you say there must have been some other reason for a person to have, behave in such a way, you still have to include the actions of Jesus here, the actions of him dealing with it and engaging it. Sure, he could have been simply working with what he knew. After all, Jesus being fully human, perhaps knew no more than others of his day and held to a more primitive explanation of what he was witnessing. However, he also could have been working with and using techniques and language and rituals those around him would be aware of and saw and sought comfort in. Let us be willing to see that the man with the unclean spirit in this story had been labeled as such by the author of the gospel, and this identifier was more than likely accepted by his peers and neighbors and in the entire Jewish culture. Jesus knows in this moment that to heal this man, he has to meet the man where he is by entering into his reality, that he is possessed by an unclean spirit. In other words, it matters little what Jesus thought because this was real to that man. Jesus saw this and acted accordingly. In laying out these possibilities, I find them both freeing and, I admit, frustrating. My final thought on the matter is that there is no straightforward answer that works for every situation. Some of you might remember that I shared with you um, one of my encounters with a family believing that some roots had been put upon them. 
This was back in North Carolina, and while it was safe to say that I was skeptical during our conversations, I met the family where they were at. My pastoral presence was to first acknowledge that I believed what they were going through and believed that this was real to them and to address the situation by offering support and comfort as best I could. Again, it didn't really matter what I believed. They did, and that was where I needed to be. When I told, uh, re, you know, was retelling this moment to one of my mentors, he affirmed that what I did was, was right. But in our conversation, when we spoke directly about the involvement of malevolent spirits, he told me, Justin, I just don't go chasing things that go bump in the night. I laughed at the time. But I also have lived long enough, and I know that there are many things in this world that defy the human mind, and while I could place all my attention on such things, existing in a sense with a mind for all matters related to the spiritual, I, at least right now, don't see the need to go looking for those roots, for those unclean spirits. I don't see the need to place all my attention on things that go bump in the night unless I need to. I say that because I see plenty of things that are worthy of my attention in the reality that I know and exist in. Why place my attention on the unseen when I see so many expressions of evil in our world today that are not afraid to hide and remain lurking in the dark? The forces of injustice seen in unfair laws, the forces of violence directed at minority groups and people who are the most vulnerable in our society, the forces of chaos that oppose cooperation with neighbors, the forces of empire, and the allegiance it calls for. Now those, those very powers and principalities that we hear about, systems, demons, those unclean spirits, well, they, those kind, <laughs> they give me enough trouble. I feel I need to address them before I go looking for anything else. Let's call them out to one another before we go looking for the things we hear scratching in our closets. Amen. Before you receive your benediction this morning, I want to personally thank, I'm, I'm glad Tim is back and playing uh, in the fashion that he does. It's always wonderful. Uh, I appreciate Kathy's piece of music again, and I appreciate Matt, uh, our music director, reaching out to me and asking if there was something special that could be played in honor of Doc, uh, who we heard about, Lauren's mentor who passed away unexpectedly down in North Carolina. So the postlude today uh, is provided by Matt, um, inspired by Lauren, in memory of Doc. Um, the song is called Cadillac in the Skies. Now hear these words of benediction. Talk about ritual and talk about tradition. These words come from the book of Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Let the Lord lift you up in his countenance and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>